Cool. Thank you very much. So hello, I'm Adrian from Vitamins, and I work with Clara, who was speaking this morning, and uh, Duncan, who's going to be speaking tomorrow. And um, I guess I, I'm an inventor, uh, but I really come from two quite different backgrounds. I come from a kind of electronic engineering background and magic. I'm a member of the magic circle as well. Um, and I, I got into electronics because I'm, I'm an absolute nerd. I love technology. I find technology incredibly magical. Uh, but I got into magic because uh, I got a Paul Daniels magic kit when I was 11. And I wrote to Paul Daniels. Um, and I just wrote Paul Daniels BBC on the envelope. And it made it to him. Uh, and he kind of got me into magic. He told me where to go, what books to get. And I think that designers have a lot to learn uh, from magicians uh, because you know, magic is all about creating an experience uh, through kind of uh, sometimes quite technological means, psychological means. There's something kind of going on, but it needs to be, cr um, a lot more needs to be done to it to actually make a magical experience. So it's really interesting uh, that we're talking about wearables in the context of magic today. Uh, because I think wearables have got a massive potential to really kind of transform and augment the world around us from very things that are very close to us and almost you know embedded all the way to the things that are around us. Wearables can make the invisible visible. Um, the wearables themselves can completely become invisible also. And all this can be done through new interactions, uh, new materials, new technologies, new chemicals. And, and engineering. So it's really fantastic today that we've got um, Lauren, Teen, Raymond, and Kieran, who I'd like to invite up on the stage uh, to talk today. It's a bit like the kind of dream team. Uh, I'll explain why in a second. So welcome. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. So I'm, I'm, you're going to find out a lot more about them in a second. But on stage now, we have a magician and technologist, an alchemist. Um, a chemical engineer and design professor and a visual artist working in interactive installations. So we have a real kind of wide range of, uh, uh, of skills here. So um, I'd like Tina to start to show us her, her work today. Um, please welcome to the stage. All right, thank you, thank you. Does it work? Yeah. yeah. There we go. All right. Hi. Um, uh, my name is Tina Beck, and I come from a fine art background. So I'm an interactive artist who work in sculpture, but I also um, use interactive design, I guess, in what I do. And I also make public art. So I'm going to talk about um, some of my research, and I'm going to show you one project and sort of stay within my 10 minutes at the same time. Um, my research is about um, interactivity and play. And I explore how we can um, engage audience into a physical participation, so kind of bridging the gap between looking and doing. And in one of my projects, I used wearable technology. I, I think uh, I've been thinking about what is magic, and I think it's about creating experiences. So I think that um, interactive art, wearables, um, it's about creating experiences, and those can become magic. And in that sense, technology sometimes is employed, but that can be analog as well. And I think that's uh, one of the things that this field does, or wearable interactive art, is that it creates culture which is experienced, not consumed. So this is sort of part of a wider shift of lots of things going on, where we're sort of moving into an era of participation in all different kinds of ways. And wearables sort of tap into that in a really interesting way. So you've heard some of those things today. Um, for me, one of the key players is technology and play, particular play, how we can use play to ignite people, to engage people, to participate as a way of, you can say, as a way of designing, thinking those strategies into what you do. And some of those things that I, I, I research is about play. In that context, I think that technology, we're, all, we're talking a lot about technology, but I, I come to technology from a very sculptural kind of material kind of point of view. I work with technologists, but I also have a good understanding of technology in the sense of that it has a materiality that is not always about what a technology can do, but you can sort of look at it from a very kind of sculptural point of view. You can, you can design with it, but it also has a, a behavior is embedded into it, so an ultrasonic, ultrasonic sensor does something different than a peer sensor or an infrared sensor in the sense of how the body can, can interact with it. 
And I think that kind of approach to using technology enables us sometimes to step beyond whether technology is new or the hype of things, but can kind of look at what it is that we can do with it as a mode in a stand instead. Okay, um, I'm going to show you Tracking You, which was a, a CAPE, it was part of a research project about play and how to engage people into play. And it explored playability and wear a wearable, um, a wearable art, I guess. It is, um, it was shown at, we were only shown it once, and it was CAPES, and it was shown at the uh, VNA, the Digital Museum, or the, v the Digital Design Weekend at the VNA, which Irini uh, is the curator of, who's here today as well. These CAPES, um, are tracked with RFID, and I'm not going to go in hugely to the technology, but it's a UPSense system, so it's a networked system, but it's not networked into the internet to all the satellites. It's a, it's a system that exists on its own, and all the capes are tracked, and what we did was that when you were moving, you created sound. So it explored how you could put a, a, an object on your body or have a wearable and interact to create sounds and interact and collaborate with other people at the same time. And what we saw was lots of sort of poses, lots of play, because obviously the, the cape is a very sort of hero-like kind of reference, so you had lots of kind of very playful behavior taking place in the gallery. They were silk printed um, with a digital pattern on the back, and people um, generated sound as they moved. So there was an acceleration, and there was a very immediate interaction. But also, there was a proximity interaction, so when you came close to someone, you would shoot them. So everything was really geared around creating a very playful kind of physical kind of game space uh, in the gallery. And I have included two sort of short clips of video that demonstrates it. If we have sound, do we have sound? Ah. We don't. We don't. I didn't think of it, to be honest. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't matter, I guess. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. They're shooting, they're, they're doing stuff. <laughs> there is lots of great sounds. No? It should work. Yeah, I'll just have to figure it out myself. All right, okay. <laughs> And there's Verity who's speaking later. <laughs> okay, that that's I, I have well, I can't really even begin to describe what what those sounds were like. But what I really wanted to show with that video is that how immediate the interaction was, that the tracking was immediate. And I think one of the things is when you're making work that is about creating play and interactivity, is I like the very readable, immediate kind of reaction. I don't like technology that doesn't work, that doesn't react, that doesn't show me the feedback, that doesn't give me the visual or the audio loop. I want it to be very simple, and through that simple interaction, the technology is um, hopefully works better, but it also means that the audience can put their own kind of experiences, their own play behavior into what they do if they're not overwhelmed with trying to figure out what it does or learning, reading a sign about what, what they're supposed to do, reading a manual. So the barrier to participation is lowered, which then means other things can develop that you're sort of designing for a space for um, the interaction to, to be created. We put the RFID on the shoulders, or I did, in the sense that this is all about working with technology and understanding that signals bodies are water and they block signals, so where do you put them? So that's just also how the capes came about, is that if you could put an RFID on your hat, in your hat, like your great hat there, that would be a great place uh, to track someone or on your shoulders. So kind of designing and making these capes was a kind of a dialogue between the technology, what it is it does, where does the signal send, how does it communicate with everything else, plus kind of at the same time looking at, at the capes. And something interesting came out of it in that we, at some point, we were using rulers to test because the capes were not done. And what I learned was that when you have um, an object that you can swing around, which is not a wearable, 
you move much faster. The testing wasn't really real because you can swing your arm a lot faster, just like when you play Wii and you're just sitting down and you're just flicking your wrist to, to play tennis. You're sort of gaming the game. Whereas when you have a wearable, you have to move your body. You have to be in the space. You have to actually engage. And I think that that possibility is what creates a sort of kind of matic and play and, you know, behavior that perhaps you wouldn't have engaged in in a gallery. How am I doing on time? <laughs> All right, good, okay. Um, so just got a few more slides then. Um, I think play is a really powerful, and, you know, that it, we can, it, it can engage people into interact. When we play, we sort of invest in the moment, we care. So we can then go beyond what the technology does. And the te technology in this sense was quite invisible, you know, it was there to create interaction and engagement and play in the gallery. And I think that that sort of wearable magic or wearable is that playful body, is that, you know, us jumping, skipping, doing, you know, you, you saw the examples earlier on, they were all very sports related, you know, it's all about the body and the technology sort of kind of merging into some sort of interaction which may or may not be magical, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, and that's it, that was my last slide, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to invite um, Lauren on stage now. Thank you very much. Is this working? Hello. Yeah. I've got loads of videos, so we better get sound. <laughs> Yeah, the presentation is about to have sound just for a moment. Is that right? Just while I go to yeah. the time. Yeah. Okay. But we're just going to do a little plug. Hello. Oh. Here we go. Okay, so we're just going to do a little swap because we're going to try and get the sound to work um, on Lauren's um, presentation. So I'd like to invite Raymond to come and present. Thank you very much. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm a chemical engineer who did chemical physics and then did material science and then joined, went to industry and then found that in industry, too many of the things I was making uh, sat in the ether and didn't get used. They were intermediate. And so I was able, luckily, to go to uh, Royal College of Art and spend four years trying to understand a little bit more about the interaction between uh, science and design. And some of that I'm going to talk about here, if I can get back to the beginning. Um, and I, was, I, I wasn't quite sure what to say. And then I, I have to say that the person in the front row, uh, uh, Clara uh, Gagara, when, Gagaro, when she uh, put up some things a couple of weeks ago, it suddenly twigged. Uh, I might be able to say something interesting to this audience about uh, what does wearable mean to me, which is not about clothes. Okay, so uh, I'd like to start with this um, by Rosalind Franklin, uh, who didn't get the uh, Nobel Prize, when she should have done, as part of a three-person three team, which was a lady in the 1950s, and that proved difficult. 
Uh, science and everyday life cannot and should not be separated. And if you like, that's what I believe in. And it's that which is driving my own work, which is to bring a group of four designers and four scientists together in the same environment with no offices, just a studio as lab and a lab as studio. So the first piece of magic, maybe, uh, just to mention magic, I don't really know what it is, but we'll hear about that later, um, is, the, is, the fact, ooh, is the fact that all seven billion people on the planet use textiles. It is the one and only material that everyone uses or wears. More than plastic, more than paper, more than wood, more than steel and metal, textile is worn and used by everyone. But things which are, are new and come to fruition uh, take time. And, and when Suzanne was talking, you, Suzanne started in the 90s and doing what she's doing. And here we are 20 years later. And this slide maybe shows some of these as well. Um, instant coffee, absolutely essential in people's lives. Took 22 years to become realized and ubiquitous. Um, the zip. Uh, took uh, about 30 years to become ubiquitous. And of course, you've now got this business of nanotechnology and so-called wearable technologies. Uh, wearable technology starting around the 1990 level. Well, we're already 23 years in. And you should ask yourself the question, has much changed? I don't think so. So the human at the center of wearable technology, and this is really inspired by Clara, really. Um, how does an airport wear things? How does a library wear things? How does a house wear things? A car, furniture. And then you get to this trivial bit, clothes. And then you get inside the body about what, do, what is wearable. And that's a 10 to the 9th length scale problem from the kilometer to the micron in terms of how and what and why should you wear things. And since we're talking about the future, I thought I'd give you a, a snapshot of how I see the future. And there's four, I put in, four, in red in four things here. One was in, is nanotechnology, and then this idea of printing anything, and then eco economies based on systems biology, which was touched on, and then create any material by molecular design by 2095. But the most important one is the thing at the very top, that perhaps, just perhaps, we'll have no more war anywhere. So the future of materials and effects, designed through fashion and lifestyle, meeting STEM, science and technology, through healthcare and, and wellness. <coughs> Maintenance and end of life futures of wearable materials. And you'll notice every time I use the word wearable, it's in inverted commas because I'm not sure what wearable means. But repair, recycled, degrade, durability, cleanliness, using materials which can benefit the human in some way. And of course, a lot of that is inspired by both biology and by bot bot plant science, botany, in terms of looking at how do plants uh, over a billion years create interesting surface effects, which uh, we as humans think by having a 3D printer, we might do in two weeks. Impossible. Wearable surfaces, though, and future needs, the idea of ergonomic considerations from ease of use, self-assembly of materials, to functional profiles, that do, which are primary through demands of activity, adaptive physical comfort, protection, camouflage, to needs of the body, insulation, physiological comfort, soft to touch, through to additional functions, remote health monitoring, spatial and temporal transformations, i.e. 4D printing, superhuman extended natural abilities and emotional products and services and anticipatory medical benefits. Here's a, a biosuit that's developed by Dava Newman at uh, MIT um, in terms of looking at long journeys in space. And the interesting thing is that the basis for this garment comes straight out of Italian motorcycle leather design. So here's a puzzle, though, that the current textile wearable industry shouldn't exist at all if you were starting all over. 
It's still extremely energy, water and chemicals intensive and wasteful of materials. And even worse, to cap it all, we discard what we buy on average every two years. So we use 5% of the world's energy to make textiles. And do we really care? It's frivolous. It's thrown away. It's not an important industry. So how are we tackling this? This group I have, this p cube die, printable, paintable, programmable materials, we have centered our work on this matrix of 12 types of material that can perhaps bring the far future to the near future. And you, if you look at these material um, types, you'll probably recognize some of these names. But if you're going to have materials, you better have appropriate technologies. One of the reasons that nanotechnology, nanotechnology hasn't taken off the way everyone expected was that the nanoscience is brilliant. The nanomachines to actually fabricate things is almost non-existent. So just to make a little tennis racket, give you an extra one meter per second, or a golf club that can give you an extra five meters isn't changing the world particularly. But it's slowly getting there. But you need the fabrication technologies to go with the new matrix of new materials. If you don't bring these together in the appropriate ways, it becomes quite meaningless. <coughs> so the future, functional biomaterials and textiles and you had a little bit from Suzanne on this, the convergence of sensors, informatics, and material science. Sensing, treating, regenerating through what we might be able to wear around the body, uh, on the body, and also in the body. And it all depends on this little spherical object. Design of functional materials through the unification of the cell as an, ex as an extraordinary example of functionality. And again, the idea behind the cell, though, uh, with all this functionality, is really how best to economically fabricate biofilms and surfaces. Because if you don't do that, this, all these huge benefits that are incorporated into the cell won't become available to us in terms of how it becomes ubiquitous and easily used. So wearable futures, yesterday it was clothes for protection and discretion, cotton and wool on the body, purposeful. What is it today? Clothes for attraction, comfortable, sustainable perhaps, natural and synthetic, on and in the body, it's disposable and perhaps, well it is, frivolous. Tomorrow, new surface platforms, morphable, durable, Super synthetic and biologic in form. Super synthetic meaning our ability to, instead of use, using silicon, using organic chemicals which act like silicon but are fluid. So, in and around the body, responsive and probably most important of all, refunctional. A material can be designed and programmed to re be refunctional. A dress can be made into a chair. So, how do we do that? We have people and resources. This is the, the group at p I, myself in material science and printed organic electronics, uh, Veronica Capsuli working in biomimetic surface engineering, Anne Toomey who works in printed textiles, um, Lynn Tandler on digital weaving, uh, Justin Perry on enzyme chemistry, um, uh, Trevor Duncan on industrial design, uh, Sapphire Goss who's an a uh, visual anthropologist and who films everything we do and criticizes through the film everything we do. Um, Neve O'Connor, who's a women's wear designer, and Patrick Keating, who's a product designer, and Janine Munslow, who's a fashion interaction designer. And she's working with me specifically on a NASA project for space apparel for people to go into space for a minimum of 30 years. Quite interesting. And these are the kind of machines we use. This is a 2 and 3D inkjet printer that we can use to make structure. 
but probably the, the, the more important one is this. This is a bioplotter that allows us to make 3 and 4D biological materials and also uh, a, a range of super synthetic materials. And it allows us to put time bombs into 3D structures. The time bomb, therefore, is an element that changes itself in time and can be, be made to become active to a given external signal. So we get X, Y, Z, T. This is a 4D inkjet extrusion processor. So there's a list of our current projects. This is how we see how designers and scientists can work together. Um, the key is the human at the center. Everything we do is about what is it that will be useful and be a beneficial or will be relevant in human life. So we're working on printable, soft, flexible sensors, spatial and temporal design, stretchable sensors and electronics, uh, functional comp composites inspired by nature, biomimetic driven textile structures, etc. So the real magic in the materials we use is electro and photoactive fibers and films that behave similarly to silicon semiconductors in terms of their properties, which can be transformed into intelligent surfaces, but they look and behave initially just like water. They are clear, they have the same viscosity of water, you can pour them, you can print them, you can spray them, you can paint them, and they give you the, the basis for a freedom of fluidic design, but which can create logic and memory in that fluid that can be used to generate any form factor. So the final thing, uh, the it's from bits, um, where we're going with um, design and science that, are, that we, you'd call wearable, adventures in time and space. Designed, fabricated and programmed wearable materials through cyberspace to connected space and biospace where we are now. And where we're moving into and beyond is digital space and complex autonomous systems, but really GNR space, genomics, nanotechnology and robotics being combined to give disruptive technologies. The human as a superhuman, the human being totally connected, the human being a galactic human, someone who can exist away from the planet and still survive. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Raymond. Um, so I'd like to invite, um, it, is the sign working? Brilliant. So I'd like to invite Lauren to come and play some music. working? Yeah. yeah, sorry about that. So hello, I'm Lauren um, and I run a company called The Unseen and I'm just going to show you what I do and talk as I do it. It's probably the best thing to do. So this is our show reel. So I'm hoping that from that um, 
none of you would think that I'm sort of working in wearable technology. <laughs> um, the Unseen is a company I, I recently put together and it's all about integrating biological, chemical um, and sometimes electronic technology into fashion but predominantly through materials. Um, so I'll go a bit, I'll tell you a bit about where I came from and hopefully it'll describe where I'm going. Um, a long time ago, about eight years ago, I worked with the Manchester School of Biological Chemical Sciences to create an ink which absorbs air pollution and also changes colour to let you know how much air pollution um, you've, in, you've had around you that day. So this is the, the ink in action. So um, it changes colour from yellow to black and then reverses itself back in fresh air. And I spent um, you know, a couple of years with this ink um, really sort of exploring... I don't know, where materials can go, I guess. And, um, and for me, it was really interesting to see that although I predominantly started out in fashion, it, it got transcended into all sorts of different areas, which then made me really look into materials and, and realise that it was materials and the surroundings that I was interested in, not necessarily fashion. Um, so I went back to the Royal College of Art to, and created this piece, which is um, kind of a very self-hedonistic <laughs> two years, as anyone who's been there will know. Um, Working with technology, having Raymond as one of my tutors, which was amazing, um, and really pushing the boundaries of what wearable technology, what chemistry, what um, fabrics and materials could be. Um, and this piece actually, um, although not really noticeable in this, pro this um, picture, is actually um, coloured with um, an ink which is able to respond through several different colours dependent on the environment around it. So it starts off black, goes through blue, greens, and then ends up white. Um, and for me, just uh, leaving RCA, ended up on Kate Moss and shot by Tim Walker, um, which was a real good uh, sort of, I don't know, hack into the industry, I guess, because I've been working in the technology side of things, but wanting to break through into fashion to transcend through to all the material sectors. And when um, Tim Walker picked this piece up um, and it ended up in love, it was kind of, to me, a bit of a, OK, there's something in what I'm doing that can be accessible to a lot of people. Um, this was the artistic video, um, which was very much art directed and very much intended to hit all the blogs and to get into the fashion industry um, of what I was doing when I was at the RCA. And the next video I'll show is the actual technology. That video really kind of did its job in a sense of being able to get to the people I wanted to speak to to try and change the face of what wearable technology looks like, um, try and make it more textiles, more human, more, um, you know, nice looking. <laughs> and then this is the, the video of actually the technology that we were working on at the time. So this one is a re more recent one, the first one, which is a leather, which will change through the RGB scale. Um, this is being controlled by wind at the moment, but we're working to now control that by different parameters. So it might be electronically controlled, it might be emotionally controlled. Again, was a concept fabric. I was working at the RCA, so um, if you imagine if you're in the rainforest, you could be one colour, the desert, another colour, and the um, Arctic snow, another colour.
so where am I at now? Oh yeah, and then so having like worked, around, having graduated from the RCA, I spent like a year and a half doing possibly being in every industry quite possible, from you know like automotive through to research, through to fashion, to even working with like Hendrix Gin. And I kind of was just like, oh, I'm going in all these places, making them really cool color change products that didn't really mean anything. Um, so I kind of gave, killed that consultancy and threw a massive funeral at the Shoreditch Box Park um, and invited some scientists and also designers and artists to come together and take Holy Communion and hope that it would spur some sort of uh, collaboration for the future. Um, so I killed this company, uh, which was PHNX, uh, over, well, about eight months ago, and have then reset up the unseen and um, which is due to launch in February and our, our sole vision is to really change the face of what technologies are becoming and how the fashion industry adopts them so ultimately we can transcend through to all the material sectors and try to make a difference of how into uh, the materials that are around us it's very narrative based and I don't know if this is going to play but the it's not playing Okay, so anyone, look up the Dan Serpentine video and you'll get what it's a colour change old school video. Um, and we're now based at Somerset House and creating a little magic coven of uh, wearable tech, but not wearable tech. <laughs> Just basically trying to build a, a, a company that um, can inspire. Because for me, when I was growing up, working in chemistry and working in fashion, there was no one to go to um, right then when you first leave to go and get inspired you know you could go to museums or the science museum um, I'm trying to create a platform that is about both and that is about creating pieces that can go into Wired but can also go into Love magazine and can go into the V&A but can go into the science museum and ultimately inspire the little ones coming out now so that's where I'm at <laughs> thank you thank you very much Lauren um, so finally I'd like to invite Kieran to come in and present thank you Wow, that's happening. This is a good moment. Can I borrow you to kind of communicate? Gonna be the most, uh, this is going to be the most overqualified mic stand that's ever happened in the history of the universe. Because I'm going to ask everyone to try something. Just take a step forward for me. Um, good. Hold this for me, if you would. Good. Everyone, can you hold that? Thank you. Everyone's just going to take your two hands in front of you like this. Take your two hands in front of you. That's good. If you've got a MacBook, this will be the moment your insurance gets rinsed. Good. I want you to do exactly what I say, okay? Have your two thumbs in the air, like some kind of slightly twisted Fonzie. Yes, very good. And now take one hand over the other. I want you to turn your hands back around like this and just clasp your hands together. You got this, yeah? It's easy if you just raise your hands a little bit higher, yeah? Good, and now I just want you to rotate your hands. You're gonna to begin to rotate your hands all the way, all the way, rotate your hands all the way until your thumbs are at the top. Thank you very much. Take it. Awesome. Good. So a little moment of discovery. Uh, now, I want to talk to you about a moment about why that is the case, right? Why that works. The reason that works is because it breaks some rules. It breaks the rules of what your body should be able to do, and that's what we're going to explore. Uh, my name is Kieran Kirkland. I work uh, sometimes as a magician, well, a lot as a magician, sometimes at uh, Nominate Trust, which is a social investor and a grant maker, supports projects that make technology uh, that makes the world better. Hurrah. So um, this is Maker Magic. It's a monkey. That's good. So the reason this is here is because I've just done a three-month residency at the wonderful Pervasive Media Studio at base of the watershed in Bristol around something around magic, right? Magic and technology, what does that look like? And if we're talking about wearable magic, inherently we start to, because of the nature of the advancements we've made or, or that are being made, we start to get into that place. So I'm going to start you off here. This is really interesting, right? Sitting here, actually, and listening to the multiple backgrounds of the amazing people who are sitting before us, yeah? So we're talking about balancing up kind of like chemistry with, with also with fashion. Yeah, we're talking about a range of working uh, in multiple different environments that are combining these different worlds. And this is one of my big inspirations in the world, this guy called Robert Houdin. Has anyone heard of him? No, yeah, good. One person. Woo, bring it on. He is like a hundred and something years old. So he's dead, of course. Um, <laughs> Awkward. Um, so this guy was both a, uh, a kind of technologist, but also a magician. Back in his day, which was sort of in the 19th century, he was working a lot with, with watchmaking, right? And that was the nanotechnology of his day. It was uber precise. People were making things on a scale that had never been made before. And then he gets to 35, and he goes to get a couple of books out um, from his, I don't know, local Parisian library. And he accidentally gets two books out on magic. Um, 
And this being Robert Houdin, instead of taking them back, he thinks, no, I'll have some of that. And he starts to learn magic as well. And he goes on to become what we call today the father of modern magic, right? He's the guy who was working with automata, creating the most incredible illusions of his day. Because he was able to take on all the affordances and abilities he had with technology and apply them to, to the narrative and presentational skills that were implicit in magic. And if we're talking about wearable magic, I think this is a really important concept for us to hang on to. If you want to hear any more stories, this guy kind of stopped a, re a rebellion in Algeria um, for good or for bad simply by doing magic tricks, which is an awesome story in itself. Um, moving on, the, some of the work that I've been doing is around trying to bring together what I think Robert Houdin, if he was around today, would be doing, right? So my first place to look at was, of course, the maker movement. We all know the maker movement. You know, we've got the things about the Arduinos, the pies. But my question, and I started to reflect deeply about what is it, actually, that's most exciting here? Yeah, we think about, you know, you've got the really old, well, relatively old school kind of wearable stuff um, in terms of the whole lily pad stuff. But I think what was interesting for me is things like this, which is a psi collector which is beautiful. It records how many sighs you make over the course of the day. So it can tell you how, how happy or sad you are. So, so what's interesting about it is not the, the tech or anything behind it, or to be honest, even the interface that you're using. For me, it's the story it's telling you about how you're living. That's a really cool concept, right? And this is the thing that begins to draw out for me. So again, the questions here about, you know, this, you come across Babbage, the skydiving teddy bear. Have you seen this guy? Yeah, no, okay, but, uh, very quickly, uh, the guy who did the Red Bull skydive, Felix Baumbau, yeah, it's like five million pounds, no, 30 million pounds, five years in the making, Red Bull sponsored. Two weeks later, a guy called Dave from Shropshire sends a teddy bear into space on a hot air balloon, and it goes 31 meters above where Felix got to for 200 quid, yeah? <laughs> Fuck you, Red Bull. Yeah, so, um, so this is, which is great, and that's awesome. But what's beautiful about me is the, the story this guy is telling as well, what it enables him to do, how it enables him to, to, to bring a very different shape to the world. That, incidentally, is, a, is the view from the teddy bear's eye, which was a Raspberry Pi controlled camera. So, so moving on from here, you know, 3D printing, all good. So the question here is, like, for me, what is going on? With this kind of sense of, uh, take, think again about Robert Houdin, think about bringing together these worlds, what would he be doing today? And I think that he would probably be very interested in the biohacking movement. And the reason for that, taking us all the way back to, to turning our hands, is because it breaks the rules, right? It breaks the rules about what you can physically do. And if you're talking about magic, that's one of the key component parts. Magic does two things. For magic to work, it has to A, break the rules, and B, it has to do some, do some supernatural force. So I've been looking an awful lot about whether technology can be that narrative. Um, to break into that a little bit, if you think about how magic's happened over the course of history, right? I talk about Robert Hood Dam being the father of modern magic. It was really only in the 1800s that people started to experience magic, not as like necromancy or witchcraft, but as entertainment. And the question becomes, how did they experience it? And if you look at history, you see how magic, the way that magic happens, reflects the narrative force we have, right? So if we're going back to the 1800s, you've got the whole East India Company thing going on. You've got this discovery, at least in the West, of a, of a world in the East, which they didn't know about. So the Western magicians at the time were going, oh, you know, they were doing crazy things, like, you know, doing sort of, um, I don't know, a lot of the mind readers wore like turbans and stuff because they were trying to echo a mysterious power that no one knew about, right? And then if you move a little bit further into the turn of the century, you've got the spiritualist movement, where people have started to discover the apparent existence of ghosts. So a lot of the magic that's happening is because of that, because it's reflecting a persistent belief. Let's move a bit forwards in time. Let's go to the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Suddenly you've got Yuri Geller. And the way he's doing his magic, it's through psychic powers, because it's reflecting a persistent belief of the time. So my question really is, if you want to talk about magic, you want to talk about wearable magic, you have to understand where the magic sits. And the question for me then is, what societal narrative is magic reflecting for you? If you haven't got that story, you haven't got any magic. So um, this is what we think about sometimes if we think about next level wearable stuff. We think about, you know this guy, this like, German biohacker, see he's got this instrument which allows him to sort of take readings of his body. If you're a little bit squeamish, look away. This is kind of for my amusement. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah, no, it's good, isn't it? So this is the thing. So if you think about this, but, you know, there's, for this, is he's just collecting signals. Where's the story? Yeah, where's the story and what he's doing? Where's the narrative? So as a magician, I'll come to you about some of the narratives I've been using. But, you know, this is this thing. We're not, no one's really explored technology as a narrative. One of the issues for that 
is that technology for people who work outside of it doesn't really have any rules. So, because no one understands how it works. And as I've said, magic needs to break the rules to work. So one of the things that's so incredible about looking at these beautiful feathers, which are changing in front of you, right, is we know that feathers shouldn't be able to change color like that. We know what the affordances are of feathers. We know how they should work. And it's magic because they do something we don't understand, yeah? On top of that, as we were just chatting about before, it's, you know, it's, it's, it should be dead, right? It's lying there, it's out of the bird, and yet it's still got life in its own light. So my question for you about if you want to create wearable magic is how are you breaking the rules and what story are you using to tell those rules? Um, briefly, I'm a magician. One of the things I'm most interested in is um, what these narratives are. If you don't know this guy, he's Dr. Ryan. He did most of the psychic research in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. To give you some insight to the type of man he was, this is him doing a test. This is him attempting to mind read a dog. Um, that's where he got to. So one of the things that we were doing at the Pervasive Media Studio is saying, you know, for me, how can I use this kind of technology to create some sense of, um, uh, of doing telepathy for real? So we've had brain control devices for a while. It's very technical. Moving to this year, Washington State University, two people controlling each other's minds simply by thought alone. This guy doesn't simply look like an overweight Louis Theroux wearing a swimming cap. Um, he is, in fact, having his mind controlled by the other guy. So one guy is thinking in action, it's reading his brain signals, it's making the other guy physically uh, move. Nuts. Um, no sooner has that happened, people start to hack it. No sooner has that happened, this is the, the science, uh, we have a go. And this is us demonstrating the teleband for the world, world's first teleband uh, at the Pervasive Media Studio last week in a, in a public performance. So again, the, but the reason why that works and we thought really hard about it is because of the story that I was telling, yeah? The so, is that sort of, yeah. Um, but also, uh, it's breaking the rules, yeah? We're not just using technology. We're breaking the rules of what it means to be human by, by using technology. So those two things are really fundamental, I think. If you want to talk about wearable magic, my like drum down message really is, you know, yeah, you can break the rules by doing incredible things, but what's the story you're telling about how that change is happening? Because that's the only way you get magic. Otherwise, it's just fancy tech. Brilliant, that was really interesting, thank you. So um, I've just got a couple of questions to ask all of you first. So, um, you know, from things that really astonish you, like miracles, you know, down to little things that are almost quite surprising and quite delightful. Magic can mean quite a lot of different things to different people. Um, so kind of personally, what does magic mean to you? And um, who do you consider to be the magicians of today? Um, I'm Kieran, would you like to start? Okay. So um, for me, like, I guess I'm going to come back to that. I've literally come off it, which is the magic, magic has to do those things. It has to break rules. It has to happen for a supernatural force. That's my problem with why we haven't managed to make tech magical yet, right? because we're not breaking the rules. And that's when you have to, for me, where I've got to is you have to link it to the physical, physical things. Yeah? The reason why um, it works, uh, if someone, it never works if someone pulls a coin out your ear. If that ever happens, you punch them in the face. You're doing all magicians in the world a massive favor. But the reason that that works, right, is because you've got a coin that shouldn't fit in your ear. That breaks the affordances of what that object can do. So for me, for that tech to be magical, it has to break the affordances of an object, which almost inherently means breaking what it means to be a person or a living thing. Yeah, that's, my kind of, that's the kind of thing I think. And if you want to talk about magic, I'm like uber inspired by this kind of stuff. It's just incredible because it's, it's really moving into that physical realm. So I guess I'll take that off from that. It's good to say, like my sort of inspiration is to look at nature and to really understand nature and understand the surroundings around us and know that there's more and, and want to see more. And I just use my skills in what I can do to see what I see in my head all the time and what I want to see more of. And um, when I first started in this, this sort of chromic making color change technology, it was from a very technical background. You know, it was, it was, um, I was the conferences that I was talking at were super like technical and scientific, and it just I didn't like it. You know, it was kind of like it didn't make sense. There was no reason to why I was doing it other than it was like you know, tick the teacher's boxes. <laughs> so I kind of then went on this massive mission of like understanding how I could tell the story of, te of technology and of, of um, materials and how I could tell, I could kind of create something that would make somebody walk past a tree and understand that a leaf changing color is pretty good chemistry right there and that it is just in front of your eyes and it's almost, it's kind of alchemistic, but it's my, about searching to control and understand the surroundings and show somebody else that. I guess that's 
so I don't know what the heroes, what my magician of today is. I, don't, I, couldn't, I was thinking of that last night and I couldn't think of an answer other than hopefully that person, they don't exist yet. Hopefully they'll go away from today. And you'll all be my heroes. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know. Brilliant, thank you. Right. <laughs> um, I think uh, magic for me in this context is something that's really, really complex but it's made to look really, really simple, but does something really compelling. I can tell you the most complex material I've ever experienced in my life, uh, but it does something really compelling, is toothpaste. Toothpaste is brilliant. It cleans your teeth. It's compelling. We all want to have our teeth clean, but it's one of the most complex materials you could ever imagine, so that's quite magical for me. I, I did think about that coming over as well. Now, I had to write, write it down because I didn't know the names. One would be uh, a leading magician might be uh, Tom Heatherwick, if he could conjure up some more real uses rather than wonder, okay, uh, which is good on the wonder. But the, the other one, and I, I need to read this out, is Jesse Reno and Charles Seaberger. And do you know what they did? I needed to do it four times today to arrive here, and they invented the escalator. So for me, they're magical. <laughs> Thank you. Uh uh, you sort of said what I was going to say is that I think that it, simplicity and complexity in technology, if you can hit that, if it's simple, it just does it, it just works, so you can put yourself into it, so you can adapt it to what you want it to be, and, that, and, and yet maybe there's lots of complexity underneath it, and that creates sort of a sense of wonder that we have about it. And I think also affordance and materiality, because, I mean, coming from sculpture, that really is that sort of love of the material that, you know, if we look at things that way, I think we can also move beyond, you know, the sort of glossy, tech, shiny, efficient, you know, uh, approach we sometimes have to technology. And, and if, we, if we don't do that, we can have more magic. Absolutely. Brilliant. And, and what are some sort of existing kind of, uh, kind of magical products, experiences or technologies um, that you're really excited by at the moment? And you've talked about a lot of them today, but are there any that really stand out that you feel are just incredibly exciting and have a lot of potential? We'll go back yeah. way. Yeah, we'll go back. Um, <laughs> I, I'm never good at coming up with an exact answer, but I think all the sort of sensory technology that is developing that's becoming cheaper, that you can sort of modify and can hack, like the example of taking your Oyster card and making a bracelet out of it. I like all those, you know, some of those that were men, you know, the Maker, the Tinkers, the Arduino, uh, the Raspberry Pi, all those things that they can do, that they enable us to do, that is sort of fairly low-tech um, in some ways and, and makes it accessible for, for other people. I really, really like those things. Are we going this way? Are we? Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, right. Uh, probably the most innovative industry I've ever come across is um, sweetie-making confectionery. And probably uh, the most important material that influenced my early life was the gobstopper. The gobstopper is the second hardest material known to man. Wow. It's basically spherical, pure, and its purest form is, is sugar that you can fire through a nine-inch brick from a gun, and you can still eat the gobstopper on the other side. That's quite magical. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> Thank you, Raymond. Um, I don't really know. I was just, I'm trying to think about it, but I'm not, I mean, obviously inspired by all lots of things that are happening, but mostly what inspires me is what's happened and how much I don't really like it. Okay. And I want to kind of, that, the, this kind of like wearable tech and product sort of sensory vision of something hard and something sort of plastic to me really pisses me off. So <laughs> I'm more inspired by trying to change that than, I don't know what exists. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> So, so picking up on that, so like one of the things that you learn as a magician is that uh, effect is everything. The way you do it is irrelevant. Yeah, so, and that's really important. And that's a really interesting thing about, we had a magic hack. We had the world's first magic hack. It was awesome. So um, what we did is bring together these magicians with these uh, technologists, and they both had this in common, which is that actually technologists tend to get quite preoccupied with the means by which you arrive at an effect. 
Yeah, because they're thinking about the types of technology they can use. And magicians tend to get over preoccupied with like a certain card slide or, or whatever. And actually that's something they shared in common was that actually we should be thinking about the, the user or the effect or the audience, the participant, what happens for them, yeah? So that for me is one thing, which is why I don't think about materials too much. However, in terms of the stuff with the maker movement and all that, what excites me is not the, 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 the actual, the materials are great themselves, but actually it's the culture that surrounds it that enables you to learn and participate. That for me, I think is, is, is infinitely stronger than any advance, because any advance, in my mind, uh, is, is useless unless people are picking up and using it, yeah? So for me, that's the bit that I get excited about. I'm really happy that you mentioned um, Gobstoppers, because when you were describing your kind of lab, I, it kind of made me think of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and now I know that you are, in fact, Willy Wonka, so thank you for that. I, I, can, <laughs> I can tell you one thing about that laboratory. Uh, we've still not recovered um, from Lauren being in it, because the, the mess that she left, uh, in creative, there, when she was mess. A creative mess that she left when she was trying to um, build things for us was quite immense. <laughs> um, Kieran, you said something that kind of leads us on to the next question. Do you think that the biggest sort of like barriers, you know, because when, when Raymond was showing us that graph, um, that table showing how long it took for certain things to actually get into uh, kind of everyday use, like the zip. Um, do you think the biggest barriers to wearable technology are, are more technological or social? Or do you think it's obviously like some sort of a mix of both? I think there's a few things going on there. I think there's probably a few more in the middle, which is around cultural stuff as well. Yeah, In yeah. terms of cultural adoption, those sort of things I think are probably quite important. So um, I also think that's, that's quite... <laughs> kind of structuralist sort of question in a way. So, so the sort of thought thing for me is that I think we, we look at these barriers to adoption, the barriers of why people would pick it up and use it. But ultimately, like I'm actually, we were talking about this earlier, it's about product-based stuff for me, which is what people pick it up, yeah? So I'm going to use a comparison with a kind of crazy internet example, but which is all virtual, I know, shock horror, um, which is around like the kind of Mozilla, start of Mozilla, right? Which is around people picking up and wanting an open web, yeah? So instead of saying, well, we're going to try and argue against social or technical barriers, they're like, we're going to do that all through one product-based thing that people just want to use, right? And for me, that's a kind of real sign about how we overcome these barriers. So if we start to pinpoint barriers, I think we start to build wraparounds for those. Whereas if we just build something desirable that people like and enjoy because of the narrative it's giving you, yeah, on a social or cultural level, that's what will enable people to pick up and use it. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, it Absolutely. does. I think it's very much educational as well. Like, there's a lot of new technologies coming out that pe designers might not actually understand how to, to use. Um, and the same technologists might not understand how to design with it. Um, and I think what it becomes interesting is when you find somebody that is as sensitive to the design as they are to the technology and that they create then a product that people like. Um, and, and again, it, it's, it's, not, it's narrative, but it's, it's kind of an educational um, thought on it. So if you, and, and people, the, so if I take an example to try and explain what I'm thinking about. Um, I'm working with a gemstone company at the moment and back in the day they were lab growing gems and everyone freaked out and was like, we don't want this. Whereas now, we, that's actually pretty technical and actually, you know, in this smart materials world is actually pretty genius. And they've been doing that for 20, 50, you know, for years and everyone hated it, but now everyone wants it because they want this sort of man-made, man-controlling nature type thing. Um, and, and you, you know, you, you only have to go into Marks and Spencers to find quite a very a wearable technological fabric, you know, fabric that you don't have to iron, a fabric that you don't, that water, repels water. That in itself is a wearable tech. It's just, it's never been gimmicked as a wearable tech. So I think when the, the sort of hackers realize, well, I don't know whether hack's the right word, but when the sort of, you know, that Philips sort of era gets put to bed, for me, is a good place. I think that w the rules will then be shaped and they'll be shaped by what's made and hopefully what's, what's gonna be start to be made is a lot more interesting and useful products rather than the stuff before. Brilliant, thank you. Um, uh, my experience is that nearly all new ideas, uh, new products, uh, new services, new, are mis mistrusted by everyone all the time. <laughs> um, and essentially, technology will just keep on rolling along and keep on doing more uh, uh, fabulous things, but if they are not relevant and don't matter in people's lives, they tend to fall into the dust. It's a bit like nanotech right now. You know, how, the question is how relevant is it to, to people's lives? In healthcare, maybe possibly, and the rest, uh, maybe only a little. So I think it's very much social and societal, uh, not technological. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I think that 
I think that the barriers is that most people just have an everyday life and most people do what they do. Mm. They do what they know. And so, you know, if it's not really relevant, they don't adapt or they don't... We don't make the effort because most of the time we're busy and we just do our thing. So I think... Well, I believe in play, I guess. That's what I was talking about. I think that that play is like... Um, if we can play with things, that means uh, we can engage. But also, I think that people should test more. They should do real observation. We should actually, you know, a lot of things get invented and done or uh, created that hasn't really, you know, it's, it's it hasn't really been tested. It doesn't it doesn't have an iterative design process in it. So if you keep tweaking it, which some of the maker kind of like that kind of, you know, when you have the open source and where things always are altered and altered, but it also means it gets better and better or it gets more and more real. So we should test more live, you know, with the audience for real and allow mistakes to happen in that process. And then maybe we could make it more relevant. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Well, um, we're just out of time now, so I'm sorry there's no time for questions, but um, let's give everyone a big round of applause. Thank you so much. And um, can't wait to see. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye-bye.